All right, guys, here we go. Pitmaster and the Doc. Bing, how you doing? I'm doing good. We got, okay, we talk about icons. We got Big John McCarthy on our podcast. Our little podcast here. This is above our gym. Like, this is in a little a storage room above our gym. People are training downstairs. But the Doc and I, he's an orthopedic surgeon, a local orthopedic surgeon, we and our his daughter started going out with my son for a while. They broke up, but we're like best friends. Um, my wife thinks we're gay, and we're not quite gay. It's it's a whole different thing. You don't want to know. It's a different kind of gay. <laughs> different, it's all good. No eye contact. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, we do our podcast and we talk about everything from sports medicine, UFC, MMA, martial arts. Um, and I've been seeing you more. Oh my God, you do so such a good job on on uh, Bellator. Damn, oh thanks, God. sir. He I appreciate it. He studies the guys. I expected you to jump in the cage at one point and stop a fight. I, I thought you were gonna do that, but he didn't. Uh, so he went from the world's definitely the world's most famous and the the world's best referee, and now he's gonna chase after. What's is that your next goal? You want to be the next uh, commentator? Well, there's, look at if you're going to do something, there's no point in trying to do something and being half best. You always want to work towards being the best. So, yeah, I know I'm not there yet, but my job is to put in the time and effort and all the work to, and try to say the right thing so people get educated more on the sport of MMA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were and and just watching the fight. I know you. I mean. I know you're a fan and all, but you could tell when you're watching these Bellator fighters, some of them aren't, aren't really that well known, but you like knew every fucking thing about them. You knew like where they were born, where they went to grade school and shit. You were like, you knew everything about it. I was like, holy shit, how much do you, how much time, say the UFC, the Bellator, sorry, the Bellator okay. fight, fight is on Friday. How much time do you spend going over every single fighter on that card? About two weeks. I spend about two weeks of time. And I, I'll, I'll pick out and I'll start doing uh, just backgrounds and biographies on them. And then I'll start watching, you know, tapes on them, watching their prior fights, seeing what I think they're good at, where they have some weaknesses, where, where someone can give them trouble, how their style is going to match up against their opponent. So there's a lot that goes into it. I used to watch a lot of tape, you know, just watching fighters just to see where I thought they were strong and where I thought, you know what, if a guy gets in this position, he's not good at getting out of this. So as a referee, it would tell me something. So I used to watch tape, but I watch even a lot more tape now because I'm looking as a, with a critical eye towards what are they really good at, where are they weak at, and where can this fighter take advantage of them if, you know, if they're doing well. So a little bit different, but it's all fun. Huh. Yeah, it looks, it looks like a lot of fun. You're, I mean... Your guy, the guy that you're with is good. What's his name? Uh, Mike Goldberg. No, I didn't see him. <laughs> I'm going to be with three. I have. I had. Uh, I Mike see Goldberg. Goldberg. Start out with then Sean Grandy, who's the voice of the Boston Celtics, and now uh, next this week coming up, I'll be with Mauro Ronaldo. Oh, okay. Oh, so you got some big time good guys. Okay, because oh, yeah. the guy you were with this week, I didn't watch the whole show because I TiVoed it and then it, I didn't all come up. I didn't like. I didn't get to see that crazy horse guy. He fought, right? Crazy horse? No crazy horse. Oh, he didn't fight in. Bel okay, he fought in a different card then. Okay, he must have no. been a different promotion. Not on uh, Belter. We were in Budapest, Hungary. Man. Yeah, I don't think let's go that far. Was was the kick? Was the kickboxing the same night? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was actually they did the kick, they did the kickboxing first. They really set it up cool because they have the the oval the round platform and they. Put up the ropes and everything, and then as soon as the kickboxing is done, they plop the ropes, and the cage comes down from the ceiling of the arena, and they just boom, stick it right in, and we go right into uh, MMA. It's really a cool system that they use. Wow, yeah, I didn't, yeah, okay. So my TiVo just TiVoed from a prelim fight, and then at the end, it showed two girls doing a kickboxing match, and that's all it did. Yeah. So. And then the kickboxing match they had was Yorina Bars. Yeah, you know, she's like undefeated, 40-0. She's a stud. She's so good, John. She's so 
she's so good at what she does and how she does it. You know, and there's a, they can't find girls to fight her now is the problem. She beat. Did she beat Cyborg? She beat up on Cyborg. Wow, she uh, shit. she fought Cyborg. Beats up on Cyborg. She 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 fought uh, Cyborg and it was called Lion Fights, which is a uh, Muay Thai uh, promotion. Fought her here in Las Vegas and she uh, put her down three times. A five oh, round no. fight. And she, she just didn't uh, look like it. I mean, she met, she. I mean, she won easy, but she doesn't look. She does. She the way she fights, she yeah. just made it look yes. like she wasn't that much of a killer. But I guess she is. She is, man. She, yeah. man, she, she just she, she uses that girl. what's there. Yeah, you know, and she used like cyborg. She used cyborg's aggression against her when cyborg would rush at her. She would throw that teep kick up the middle, bring a knee up, bring a right, right left, and just circle out, and you go. She's a technically good kickboxer. She's Where's fun she to out watch. of? She's out of the Netherlands, man. You know, oh, yeah? The, the crazy oh, Dutch, uh, man. Dutch kickboxing. <laughs> you know, they're doctor. good. Wow. Yeah, that was good. And then uh, and then uh, um, Benson Henderson won pretty easy. Yeah, he looked really good. That was, you know, that was a good fight for him. He needed yeah. to come out and... Uh, Benson in his last couple of fights, he, he's really started slow, and he's been he's been more of the wanting to be the counter fighter and, and counter everything that's happening, and he needs to press. He needs to you know he needs to make things happen, and that's what he did against Roger, and that's honestly why I think he did so well. When he goes after people, he's good everywhere, so he's yeah. hard to deal. With. Yeah, he's like a black belt in Taekwondo and shit, and a black, yeah. he's, just, he's everywhere. Yeah, I, I like to watch him, but. Lately, I haven't, cause he, cause like you said, he's, he just lays back and he's kind of boring lately. But he wasn't boring this weekend. Nope. Uh, he, you know, he says he goes from now on. I'm going to finish fights, and you know, I, I it, the the thing about MMA is, I don't think you know, it's not the same as boxing. If you lose in boxing, everyone says, oh, you know, you you suck. MMA people don't care so much if you win or lose. They care how you fight. Yeah. If you go out and you put it all out there, then everyone loves you. Yeah. If you you know win or lose, if you go out there and you're bouncing around afterwards, and people go, well, you didn't put everything into it, and you don't want to be that guy. Yeah, and and I think a big reason for that I've always thought was because boxing is one dimensional, so there's one way to win or lose. And MMA, there's so many ways to win, but there's also so many ways to lose. Yeah, you could have uh, most guys don't have a winning or a uh, undefeated record once they make it to the top. In, in boxing, it's easier to, because you just, all you need, it's like, it's like a baseball player. All you have to do is hit. You don't have to do anything else. And yeah. to me, that's what boxing is compared to MMA, but. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's so true. Look at it. The problem, is, you know, is you get, there is so many ways to lose because you make one mistake yeah. and a guy takes advantage of it. You know, that's why there's you know, guys like Max Holloway. You know, I've had fights with him and, and he is one. The first round easy, the second round he's won. All of the third round, last ten seconds, he'll point to the center of the cage, you know, and say, you know, "Let's stand here and throw." And he just starts throwing and going. You go, "Are you crazy?" But yeah. that's what makes people love him because you know what, he is crazy, and he'll he just wants to fight, and he puts on a show, and that's what people want to see. And that's why I hate Hawaiians. It's <laughs> I had to grow up there. That's why they're tougher than hell, man. And they all know how to fight. I growing up, they, they all knew how to fight. Oh man! And I would like you know, growing up, like asking my mom, "Can we move back to the mainland?" Yeah, you know, she's like, "They all knew it." I'm, I'm telling you, you are, I, fought, man. I would fight in junior high school, and they would be yeah. like, "And every time I got in a fight, I was a, a fighter already. I was training, you know. I mean, so when I got in a fight with guys, somebody's like, "How the fuck do you know this shit?" So anyway, <laughs> I can't stand locals, man. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we got that, but. What do you think about? Well, it's, that's a that's a dumb question to ask you. Uh, um, what do you think Bellator has to do? The dumb question was, how do you feel about Bellator compared uh, compared to the UFC? But I'm not going to ask that question. But how do you think Bellator can uh, can start being more more competitive? What do you think they got to do? Besides, they got you now, and they have Goldberg too. <laughs> Where, they got Goldberg. Why wasn't he there that that fight? Uh, because his son was in a uh, is on a uh, a state uh, hockey team that was going to the nationals, oh. and uh, 
it was his chance to see his son play in the Nationals, and he he took that, and it's the right thing to do. Yeah, you can't miss that. No, yeah, nope. he's he loves it. Hockey, and he lives in he lives in Arizona, doesn't he? Yeah, exactly. And he's yeah. a hockey fanatic. Mister Hockey living in Scottsdale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but so what do you think the Bell Bellator has to do, not to be the same as the UFC, no. but to be equal? Well, yeah, well, if you if you're looking at the differences in the two, there's a straight out for me. There's things as far as production wise that the UFC does that Bellator needs to start doing it's things like the UFC does UFC tonight. They do the weekly shows. Bellator needs to start doing that to start marketing their fighters because they have some incredible fighters. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're looking at the, you know, the truth is, and people will get mad at me for saying it, but the truth is if you look at the top, you know, the top four in Bellator in the in different weight categories, they match up exactly with the top four in the UFC. You know, you take a look at the 145-pound class in Bellator. It's got uh, Patricio Ferrer as the champion. Look at He can fight with Max Holloway. He is tough as hell. He can fight with anybody. He's, you know, I don't know, probably about 24 and 4 as far as his record. You know, one of those is a loss to Benson Henderson where he was winning the fight and he broke his leg. You know, that happens and stuff. But look at the top guys can fight. Equally yeah. straight across. You look at Eddie Alvarez was a champion in Bellator, and he went to the UFC and was a champion in the UFC. You know, and so you have those people there. The question is, you've got to get people aware of them. Bellator sometimes uses older fighters like you know Chael Sonnen and Quentin Rampage Jackson and them to try to draw people's not Chuck eyes, Liddell. so they can see. <laughs> I hope not, because I don't want to see Chuck fight. I I'm with you, I and it's not because I would love to see Chuck fight but I don't want to see Chuck fight at this age and I want him to stay retired because he's done everything that he needs to do. Oh God. Yes. You know? But we've had this conversation, but so you think, okay, so I, I, I look at Bellator a lot like, and I love this part of it. I like the fact that they throw in kickboxing and some of their entrances. I like some of their pride type stuff. I like that stuff. I mean, people miss that shit, you know? Um, but I don't know what it has to do to, you said, mar more marketing. I agree with that. Uh, well, they need that. They, they, they also need to start, you know, uh, there, there's things that are wrong. in if you're live fights, you've got to be shown live on TV. Now, if, when Bellator goes on, on the East Coast, it's live. On the West Coast, it's delayed. Oh, you can't yeah. have that. I don't know. That. You know that, that doesn't work. You know, people want to see things live. So there's things, you know, production-wise, as far as Viacom, they need to start looking at how to do things in a better way for the fans in presenting the actual fight material out to them. So that has something to do with it. And then, you know, it's just a matter of fighters got to fight and put on good fights. And yeah. we do have great fights a lot of the time. We got great champions. You know, yeah. there's guys out there that are fighting this week is not a championship fight, but it's got Michael Chandler against uh, Brandon Gertz. It's going to be a great main event. It's got A.J. McKee, who's the son of Antonio McKee, and what? he's fighting... And Lawrence, yep. They're still fighting at the same time, pretty much. Huh? <laughs> Antonio, yeah, did he Antonio's just retire? Uh, did Antonio retire? Yes, Antonio retired. Not very long ago. Not that long yeah. ago. No, he didn't. You know, and so, but his son is phenomenal. His son is an athlete. You know, he is fast. He's a good wrestler. He's long. He's uh, ten and zero right now in his uh, his career in Bellator. So he's fighting well. Yeah. Okay, and then they had that. Who was that really good wrestler out of AKA um, that just fought, and he won. He won, uh, and Crazy Bob was in his corner. Oh, let's see. They had. Uh, you're were, talking or? about Ed Ruth. Ruth. Ed Ruth is man. And you, Ed oh, Ruth, you know, wrestled at Penn State. He was 136 and three in his career at Penn State. Three-time national champion, member of four national teams. Uh, the guy's as good a wrestler as it gets. And, man, you take a look, John. That was his fifth professional fight. And the guy he's fighting has had 20. Yeah. That was his 25th fight. And he has a winning record, too. Oh, yeah. And that guy was good. That guy is a good. Uh, I'm telling you, Ian Pascu is a good fighter. I watched yeah. him in many fights. Yeah. He can fight. And yeah. Ed Ruth is special. Yeah. That guy's going to be very hard to beat coming up. And he's going down in weight. He was normally 185. 
but he's walking around at, uh, at less than that. And so he's going down to uh, 170. That fight, because Ian Pascu was brought in late, they, they gave him a five-pound weight limit uh, advantage to go up to 175, and Ed Ruth lost two pounds. He cut two pounds to make weight. Wow. Yeah, he's uh, – you can watch him. He's, he's so calm, so cool. Yep. Yeah, it's such a good camp, man. I love Crazy Bob. When we were coming up, and you know, I had I had like one of the biggest name you know teams around, and we were like, you know, we were like in the top five in the world. And I was like, anytime I saw Crazy Bob across, across from me, I was like, oh fuck, he <laughs> is. He was a fuck. His guys are, and the and they're, that team with Z uh, Zinkin, you know Zinkin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean with that guy, those 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 dynamics, man, that's and you know Zinkin was Chuck's manager. Yeah, Wayne Zinkin was. Yeah, Dwayne. And uh, uh he was like the only guy that wasn't that's cause on, he's pretty uh, good at it. AKA. And uh but he brings in these top level wrestlers, uh, you know, from all over and they they yeah, it's it's a pretty awesome uh team right now. But yeah, it's a smart system they use too. Yeah. It is. It is. But it was. But okay. So, can you? Are you allowed to talk about the, the fights at the UFC, or would you rather? Yeah, not? absolutely. Okay, I don't want to get you in trouble, man. Okay. Right, before you, before you do, I want to hear this. So, John, how did you meet this guy? I want to know. It, everyone that I know that knows John has a, some weird story or something about how they met John. How did you meet John? Did you meet him at a fight? You know what? The first time I met John was at a fight. You know, but John is a—he used to have a. God, I want to say Antonio Banuelos, and a great little fighter. Yeah, you know, 135 pound bantamweight or so. What's that? He's a—he's uh, our team captain now. He—he's the one that runs the team now. He's still ugly, I'm sure. Oh uh, yeah. But he he's won't admit to it. Bisexual, but, bipolar, bi, bi uh, bilingual. <laughs> yes. But, you know, that was the first time, you know, uh, I was doing, uh, I was at a show and John was there with uh, Antonio. And then, you know, obviously he came out when Chuck was fighting. And uh, I was doing a lot of Chuck's fights because Chuck started in the UFC about UFC 17 or so. And, uh, you know, I just always appreciated the fact that John was one of the, the trainers that was a true trainer. Because in the beginning, we had a lot of guys that had no idea what they were doing. I mean, it was... Uh, it was a, it was like, I'm going to have my best friend in my corner where well, your best friend doesn't know shit about fighting and your best friend is being a cheerleader <laughs> instead of telling you what to do. And that's not going to help you in the fight. And then in the end, your best friend doesn't know when to say, Hey, you've had enough because there's times when, you know what, you just have given everything that you can in the fight and there's nothing else you can do. And you're getting your butt kicked and your friend's going to send you back out there when your trainer who should be your friend too tells you, hey, that's it, I'm pulling the plug, this is over. And that's one of the things that John Hackleman would always do if he saw that his fighter had nothing left and you know there was nothing more to give. Well, I'm not going to send him out there to get hurt. You know, He would always pull that plug, and I always respected John for that. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, thanks. I, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's become a problem um, because it's, it makes me sound good, and it, I think I am good for a lot of things. But I stop at it a little too early sometimes because I get so emotional. And I've yeah. actually stopped fights where the guy actually could have gone on. I've never done it in a really big show, so it didn't take somebody out of a UFC title. But yeah. but I've done it on smaller shows where he definitely or she could have gone out that next round. But I just I just see no reason for it. I, I stop it sometimes just a little too early. But I'd rather be a little too early than a little too late. Uh, but like I said, with Chuck and with the UFC guys, I've never done that yet. But for yeah. some of my smaller shows, I've kind of gotten flack from even the doc. And usually the doctor wants to stop it before anyone else. Now, usually the corner's saying, he can go on, he can go on. And the doc's like, no, it's over. It's usually the other way with me at the small shows. Like Antonio's <laughs> last fight, I threw in the towel. That was his last fight. I said, you're never fighting again. Um, he fought some guy that's fighting in the UFC, uh, Jody something. I forget his name. Uh, he's from uh, Jackson's. But um, I stopped the fight. I, I saw enough. I saw him rocked. And he was rocked. He was like, 
I saw his knees. I, I know Antonio. I threw in the towel. And, like, the doctor came to me and said, well, why'd you stop the fight? I was like, because my fucking guy is hurt. That's why. And I'm not going to let him get hurt anymore. <laughs> Jesus Christ, shut the fuck up. If I throw in the towel, fight's over. So, but anyway. Well, you know, <laughs> you know the, the problem with this is that everyone looks at, everyone looks at every position there is in fighting. It, you know, the only one that they don't look at the same is the fighters themselves. But be it a ringside physician, a referee, just everyone is like, well, they're all the same. And they're anything but the same. And, you know, look at it. We have cut men that are really good at their jobs. And we have cut men that suck. We have referees that are really good at their job. And we have referees that suck. And we have ringside physicians. Some of them are good. And some of them are just horrible, you know? And so I, I've seen rings that ringside physicians that would let someone get beat to death, you know, and they have no clue of what it is to be a true ringside physician. It's not an easy job. And, uh, John, I, I would take your opinion over their opinion anytime. Oh, thank you. And I sometimes, I don't know if you remember, but I used to go back after the cut or whatever, and I used to stitch them up in the dressing room. And I remember Dana <laughs> yeah. walking in yeah. once like, like, what the fuck is going on? And I was like sewing up Chuck after his fight in, uh, I think it was Japan when he fought uh, over him. He had a little cut and I sewed him up. But uh, but yeah, um, that's that's definitely that's definitely true. And uh, all right, let's let's go to let's go to refs. Can you um, let me tell you my? I'm going to tell you. I you you're probably in a different position than I am. But uh, so my refs and I always tell these guys, my my favorite ref in the whole world ever is Big John McCarthy here. And then after that, it kind of goes down. But right after, on the next tier, is, to me, Herb Dean. Um, and then it goes down from there. And then, but catching up to Herb Dean, I think Magliota is really good. And I think Mark uh, Mark Goodard is, is making way... I mean, I think he's... Because, like you, you're not just the referee... You are a persona in the cage that people had to reckon with. Do you remember this look right here? What is it? What am I doing right here? Who is that? <laughs> that's, that's grabbing somebody, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about that with my fighters the other day. And I said, if Big John ever has to do that to you and put you against the cage, I'm fucking throwing in the towel. Because he, it was the cowboy. <laughs> the cowboy, uh, right? That was. Charles Oliveira. But it was the Cowboy Oliveira, right? Is that the... Yeah. Yeah. From and he, Brazil. And he, what? From Brazil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was yeah. getting stupid. And yeah. Do you remember that? No. <laughs> Big John grabbed his face and said, if you want to be a champion, act like a fucking champion. Because he was acting stupid. So Big John actually, like a kid, he grabbed his face. And I think you got a little bit of flack about that. Did you? Oh, of course. You get, you get people that say, you shouldn't do that. You know, and it's like, look at what I'm doing is taking someone who's starting to lose control and bringing their mind back on what's important and getting them focused on, hey, you don't have to act like an idiot. You have to be under control for you to win this fight. Because, you know, if anyone knows, John, you do. When you fight angry, you lose. Yeah. Uh, you, you cannot fight angry and do well because your emotions start to get involved. Fighting is about using the, the most important tool you have is your brain. That's what makes everything else work. And when that brain is firing off because it's angry, you're usually going to make mistakes and it's going to give somebody the opportunity to beat you. So, and my whole point is to get him back under control so we can let the fight go on and he can perform at his best. But it's things like that. And I think Goodard saying Goddard or Goodard, but whatever. Goddard. Goddard. Mark Goddard. Goddard. I love them. I love when he told uh, it was the girl with the blonde hair from uh, Jackson's Holly Holm and he and the other girl. And they weren't really doing much. And he said, I know you guys probably have a really good strategy, but you got to make something happen here. And that was like, <laughs> yeah. it was classic. Yeah. Now, Mark, you look at Mark is an outstanding referee. Yeah. If there's a, if there's one guy out there that if we you know if I was gonna say he thinks like I do, Mark Goddard's the guy that thinks like I do. He, you know, when he'll he'll ask me a question, I'll start to answer. He goes, I knew that was the you know. And He's a lot it's like a matter. You. Yeah. Of, you know, we we all do things different. Herb does things 
Yeah. Well, yeah, mechanically, there's things that I don't like that Herb does, and there's things that he, you know, he doesn't like that I do. But the one thing that I always say about Herb, Herb is very good at recognizing when someone is hurt because a lot of guys don't. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing. What what you're trying to do is, as the referee, you're trying to always slow the fight down. The more you know, the more that you understand about the fight, the more you know as far as is this guy in danger or is he not, that makes the fight go either really fast or it slows it down. And Herb has a very good eye for seeing if someone's hurt and so the fight slows down for him, which makes him usually make that right decision. Yeah. Like with Sylvia. Remember that arm break thing? Everybody thought he was yeah. wrong at first. One of the That's one of the funniest moments I ever had with her. Because he, yeah. he thought he was in such trouble and the crowd was like booing. Oh, then, they wanted to they wanted to lynch him. Are you kidding? Oh yeah. And then 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 they and then they the, the big camera the big screens were there and it showed his arm snapping. And Herb Dean, yeah. he didn't want his arm to be broken, but he probably went, Holy <laughs> shit. He he dodged a bullet. Now I tell you, you know what I one it's one of my favorite stories because in that fight I was actually position right next to Pat Militich, Jeremy Horn, and Matt Hughes were in Sylvia's corner. I was right next to Matt Hughes. And so they had the same view I did. And you saw Tim's arm down there, but you see Tim get his elbow basically past the groin section of yeah. uh, Frank Mir. So you think, oh, he's going to be okay. And all of a sudden, Herb Dean is stopping the fight. And they went crazy. They were up screaming, you know, calling him every day, saying, you're an idiot. You're the worst thing ever. And I went up to Herb and I and I looked at him. I said, "Hey, what did you have?" And he goes, "John, his arm broke. I saw it and I heard it." And I said, "Okay." I said, "All right." And the doctor was looking at Tim's arm and because Tim was saying like, "No," and he's moving his hands and and the doctor's looking and she looks at you know Herb and says, "I, I don't see anything wrong with because she's looking at his elbow." Yeah. She's not looking at his forearm, yeah. and it's you know Herb doesn't cuss, and it's one of the only times I ever heard cuss. He, Herb looks at her and goes, "X-ray that motherfucker." <laughs> and so, uh, the, the, right about then, they put it up on the screen, and you see it. You know, it oh broke both bones in two spots, and uh, it was a great call by her. Oh my it, god! Sometimes I can tell you as a doc uh, at sporting events, something happens and it's not swollen yet, and it doesn't hurt yet. So, yeah. you know, you the doctor's looking at it going, I don't know, it's not swollen, and it's, he's not even saying it hurts. Um, and they, you can really get fooled. You know, I've seen that as well. So, Oh, my God. That was, that was one of the scariest moments. I remember just thinking, I remember it because I like Herb Dean, and I remember just thinking, he just, that was it. That's it. He's never going to ref again. That was, he just fucking made the biggest. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I looked on the screen, and it was like snapping. I was like. Oh, thank God! I'm not thank God it broke, but thank God for Herb. Yeah, okay. uh, that was that was, that was. Then there was another thing that just happened with uh what they they had to come and ask you something about the time. Um, shit, what fight was that? What happened? And he uh, something about the fight. Oh, he stopped it right when the clock went off. Oh no, he <coughs> hit him after the the bell. It was uh, wasn't it a uh, Hector? Were you there for that oh. one? Yeah, you're. That was uh, Hector Lombard against uh, C.B. Dalloway. Yeah, we yeah. talked about that. So what did you think of that? You know, look, at the, the whole thing is people get this idea that, you know, the, the bell stops the round, and it does, okay? It is the signal for the round to end. But I'm telling you there are times when you can't hear that. In fact, John was part of a fight when – Chuck first fought Tito Ortiz back at UFC 47. At the near the end of the first round, Chuck opened up with a great volley of combinations, a head kick coming after Tito, and the crowd just exploded up as far as uh, the sound volume. And they have the horn, and they went to honk the horn, and you couldn't hear it. And I had this system of when I heard that you, you'll notice when you'll hear that clack 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 of the boards and that that is really for the trainer that's what that system is in there for is to tell the inspectors and the trainers get yourself ready the ground's coming to an end there's 10 seconds left they're grabbing their buckets they're grabbing the stool and all their stuff and moving themselves to that cage door but if you notice i'll always point towards the timekeeper and the reason i point towards the timekeeper is because of that fight with tito and chuck and i realized 
that I need to signal that timekeeper so they know that I heard that that 10 seconds right. has gone right. off and that round's going to come to an end. And I've told them, if, you know, every time I work, I would go and tell them, look, if I, if I don't point at you, that's telling you hit that thing again because I didn't hear it and I want to hear it. So you'll see that I'll always point towards the, uh, you know, timekeeper. And then as that round is coming and I'm counting down in my head, when I get to two, I'm moving pretty close to the guys and one and I'll hear it. And you'll see my arm will actually come in between the two fighters and I'll call time. And the reason my arm comes between the two fighters is I know that as my arm is going through, if it's not extended and something goes by it, it's legal. But if my arm extends out, that's enough time for the fighter to see me, hear me call time, hear everything. And if his arm goes past it when my arm is straight out, it's past the bell and that's a foul. And that's, you know, that's why you try to do the same mechanic as a referee all the time to set yourself up to be successful. I think in so that what, case, didn't he got disqualified based on his counter. It was basically a counter to a kick or something. It was um, a double counter. He threw, a, he threw a right and a left hand. Yeah, so yeah. after the horn, but uh, yeah, so he got disqualified yeah, in that. We, and, we talked about Look at it. Who's responsible? Well, the referee did 90% of what he was supposed to, but there was 10% missing. He did not get himself visually in between to let Hector know and to try to deflect. I can tell you, you know, one of the funny ones I had was another one of John's fighters, Court McGee. I'm trying to think of who he was fighting, but it wasn't that long ago. And right at the end of the round, he goes and I'm coming in to go time and he throws a kick and I grab the kick, you know. <laughs> and when I grabbed the kick, you know, it actually hit my arm and it made my arm go dead. You know, and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to shit. I'm, I'm not trying to make it look like anything. I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, I'm so old that I got kicked to the arm and my arm's dead. But that's your job as the referee is you need to make sure that, that blow doesn't hit somebody after the bell. Huh. What, okay. I got one. Um, I saw a guy get, and they, they sh it proved it did brush his eye. Uh, but what do you think about, and I have an um, opinion, what do you think if somebody says, you know, like the eye, somebody touches their eye and they, they, they step away and the referee didn't see it, do you think the referee should give them, you know, like check his eye, maybe see the, uh, see the review? Or if he didn't see it, should he just say keep fighting? Well, it, you go off of a couple of things. You know, first off, fights are fast. And everyone expects the referee to see everything. It's impossible. You can't see everything. And so there are times that fighters will complain of an eye poke when they got punched. Chuck, when Chuck fought Tito, Tito complained that Chuck I got you know, th you know gouging him with the thumb. Yeah, it was a knuckle. It was and, a knuckle. And I told him, yeah. No, okay. said, no, that's a punch, right? And as the fight was going, he starts to go away. I said, that's a punch. It's legal. Go right. And Chuck goes after him and finish the fight. And you'll get that with fighters. And so you, you want to see everything you can. But th sometimes if you don't see, you can also see a reaction from both fighters. You'll see a reaction of the one fighter starts to grab like, oh, like this. And the other will put his hand out like, oh, sh I'm sorry. And he'll put this hand up like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. And it's telling you, yeah, he, he touched him there. He, he poked him in the eye. And you can, even if you say, I didn't really see it, you can, hey, time. Because of what both guys have done, it's giving you the information. Uh, his hand went out and touched him in the eyeball. He got poked. Okay, I'm going to call time here. But if you don't see that and you see nothing other than one guy going like this and you didn't see an eye poke, you're going to have to be pretty, uh, pretty uh, careful in calling time. I'm going to let it go. You know, but you got to go there, with what you see. Don't they now just show you like the replay right away? There is no replay for you. You know, in, in MMA, the only replays we have, and, and not all states even allow replay. Yeah. The only replays that you have are what we call fight-ending sequences. It's the only time you can utilize a replay is you have said that the fight is over. This fight is over. Now I can go to replay and say, is this fight-ending sequence due to a foul? If it's due to a foul, I can make a decision on it. Or is it, no, that's a legal legal action that occurred and, you know, the fight's over with this person being a winner. But 
You don't get to have a replay and then go back and say, okay, fight. That doesn't yeah. happen in MMA. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, they, they announce that in most of the fights, if it's allowed, but it they, they can't restart the fight. Yeah, so, there's, you, I, you will I not gotta, see it started. That's not the way it works. I'm so nervous. The eye poke, to me, I've been everything. I've had everything done to me, and an eye poke, uh, to me, is the worst. And I feel like, so many fighters, I'd say 99% of the fighters, if they poke someone in the eye, they're going to, they go, oh, sorry, they're going to admit to it. And then there's the You're 1%. Right. I can think of two guys right now that aren't going to do that. I'm not oh, going to yeah. name them. But I know that Glover, like people say, oh, give him a cut. He had three minutes. If you get poked in the eye, Fucking three hours later, you're you're barely yeah. seeing. You're still yeah. seeing double vision the next day. Like three minutes isn't going to do shit. But I mean, that's all they get three or five minutes. But yeah, with an eye poke, to me, it's talk, almost fight ending. You're talking about when Glover fought John, and and that was just it was bad. You know, there was that was a, that was a time when you look and you go, it's re- it's difficult for the referee, and you have a situation championship fight. But you know, John used to you know stick his hand out look he has such a wingspan and he used that you know hand going out to keep someone at length that you know the new rule that was put in was put in because of john jones you know there's a new rule about extended fingers and that came about basically because of one fighter you know and that's, that's you know that's why good, you that's have, not a good legacy i think i think no. uh i think gan mcgee's legacy for a foul is is uh at least that wasn't illegal when he did it no, it wasn't illegal when he did it, but man, he caused me nothing but problems. <laughs> he's, you know, yeah, he just had his second kid now, and he's a he's in charge of uh, security of about uh, a like this one company owns like ten bars down in our in San Luis Obispo, and one of the guys that owns them is Eric Schwartz, who was the first opponent of Glover Teixeira, <laughs> and he beat Glover Teixeira, knocked him out. And then that's why Glover started training with us. No kidding. Yeah. And um, so anyway, um, he's one of the owners of all these nine bars. And uh, Gan McGee is the head of security. That's great. I'm glad to hear that Gan's doing well and he's got another kid. That's awesome. Oh, he's doing, he's doing great. I, I get to see him at the supermarket sometimes. And his wife actually trains here, uh, does the fitness class. And uh, yeah, he's, he's doing fan, fantastic. That's right, great. Well, Gan me. stands out wherever he's at. What? Gan stands out wherever he's uh, at. Literally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, can, okay, can you answer this? I already told you my my three, four. Okay, who's your favorite? Give me your four favorite referees. I mean, you already listed them. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I was watching UFC back long before I knew John, but I remember seeing you, like, on Friends or something. Yeah. yeah? Were you on Friends? So, yeah. yeah, he was like, because they had an episode where back when cage fighting was like this huge taboo. Oh, my God. It was like, I think it must have been early, early days of UFC. But it made it onto like prime time. Oh, and yeah. somebody's boyfriend or something wanted to, he was nuts. Monica's boyfriend. They made him so crazy because he wanted to fight in a cage. But I think you were, he was on it. I, so, I, I mean, uh... you go back to all the way back to when I started watching the UFC. Yeah. Who? Were you at UFC like one or something? One or two? I was at right? UFC one. I yeah. started refing at UFC two. I, I was a uh, was actually Hoist's sparring partner, getting ready for UFC one. So, what's more stressful, starting that job at UFC one and two, or this new job? I mean, is it just like a whole new thing, having to learn it all over again? Or uh, I'm too old and dumb to get stressed anymore. Yeah, <laughs> get stressed anymore. It's like that's good. So it's not a stressful job. Not as stressful at all. No. Do you, you know, still I, do your ref school? Back at UFC 2, I didn't think that would be stressful either because I was like, well, you know, there's not a lot to do. There's no rules, so it's going to be easy. <laughs> and it wasn't easy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine it was easy. Uh, do you still have your ref school? Yeah, still have it. I'm going to be uh, probably teaching a course here come uh, the second week of July coming up in Las Vegas. I want to be a ref. I just, no, you don't. I don't no, think. I, I don't, John there's would only, be a commentator. I don't know about only, ref. John would stop all the fights. I would stop every fight. <laughs> if he got hit, and if he got hit, and I just see him wobbled, I would jump in and stop. I would be in so much. I would last one card, and they would like fucking fire me. You know, I stopped a fight that I wasn't involved in once, right? No. <laughs> I was sitting front row of a fight once, and I thought this guy was taking such a beating, 
and I was feeling terrible. I, I was getting emotional. And I stood up and I said, stop the fight. And the referee stopped the fight because he thought I was, you know, I was in a corner. So he stopped the fight and both corner men are like going crazy. And uh, he like came over to me, the side of the, it was like ring. He goes, are you in either one of these corners? I go, no, but the guy was getting his ass ripped. He goes, you actually just told me to stop the fight. They were so pissed. They restarted. The commissioner yelled at me and they restarted the fight. And the guy that I stopped it for ended up winning. There you go. So, but anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I would be a terrible. So never scratch that. You also scratch cover that. your eyes sometimes in the fights. He doesn't like to see people get oh hurt. God, so. I hate when we that. watch the fights. He he leaves the room sometimes. I'm, I'd be the worst. And if like I I have a girl now, and um she she's fighting. She's two and zero. Oh, but I tell her I tell her before the corner. I said, I'm telling you right now. I don't care if it's chauvinistic. If you get one little fucking cut on your face. <laughs> I'm going to stop the fight immediately. I don't care because guys look okay with scars and a broken nose and ears. Girls aren't going to. So I am not going to. So, you know, that going in, I, I don't want to catch any shit. And she goes, okay. So she has two, uh, two, uh, two wins though right now. So that's, that's all. What do you that think about the present work. crop of, uh, of, uh, shenanigans? Uh, well, I was going to say people, but shenanigans of, uh, in the UFC, what do you what do you think about the latest thing this weekend? You talking about the Connor thing? Yeah, it's a it's a disgrace. Let's be honest. Connor is Connor is. I look at it this way. I really like Connor as a person. I think he's a phenomenal fighter. I think he's phenomenal for the sport when he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. But when you're 28, 29 years old, and you know, John, you you know this. Back then, you thought you were invincible. I thought I was invincible. Connor feels that he is invincible. All right. And he thinks that this is going to go on forever for him. It's not. He made a lot of money with this, you know, the whole thing with Mayweather. And he's in a position where he's spending money on things and doing things that, you know, probably isn't smart, but he's young and he thinks that it's going to last forever. And he, when you get to a certain point, and everyone tells you how wonderful you are and, you know, you're, you're the best, you're the greatest. You start to believe some of that bullshit, even though it's not true, because you're no different than anybody else and you're no better than anybody else. And Connor needs to start to uh, get put under control. Now, I mean that by himself. I'm not saying someone needs to do it for him. He needs to start having some self-control, start realizing what's important how you go about doing things. You know, this whole thing about, you know, going after Khabib is like, you know, one of the best parts about MMA is if you don't like somebody, you get to go punch them in the mouth in a legal fashion. That's pretty cool because you get to beat on someone and no one is going to put you in jail for it. And to sit there and to do something where you fly in from Ireland and then you have a bunch of your dumbass friends with you, and you go and attack a bus or a van or whatever it's going to be. And that's your way of showing that you're upset with someone. I ain't buying it, dude. Get in that cage and fight him and put your hands on him. And that'll tell me how much you really want to fight him. Yeah. And for me, watching Connor's career, I, you know, there was, there's always a lot of talk in the last few years before a fight. And there's a lot of smack talk. And that's kind of his thing. But I was always impressed at the end of the fight. He would kneel with the other fighter on the mat. There was respect. You would see that, you know, a lot of his opponents, there's respect there that you expect from a martial artist after the fight. So it kind of erased for me the nonsense that happened before the fight with all the smack talk. This is a whole different this is a whole different thing, what's going on now. But I always liked that about Connor, at least at the end, if even if it was a bunch of smack talk, there was respect in the cage. You know, there was respect for that other fighter. Which I don't know. I don't know if that's changed or what's gonna happen now. I'm sure we'll see him fight again. Do you oh, think I'm he should sure. be able to fight again? Yeah. Look, you don't take someone's uh, ability to make a living away because they do a head-up-ass moment. And it was a head-up-ass moment. No, I you, know, you don't do that. And but, I, I think there should be consequences for it, but to take someone's ability to do what they do away, no, that's, that's too much. Well, I think that's been proven with John Jones. I mean... He can have a head up ass moment and come back, and people will still give you another chance and another yeah. chance. So. I don't. I don't think he should get another chance. I think. I think. I think 
first of all, he'll never need to work again. So nobody's taking food off his table because no, he'll never have. But I think, I think okay, you're you were a cop. I mean, what if you did something like that as a cop? They would take the job away. I think the same thing. I think you should be held to the same standard as a martial artist. If you did something like hit a bus, that's one thing. But just remember, that could have been somebody leaning their head up against the glass, you know, really tired after all that shit. And if that thing hit their head, like he, like he didn't even, he went, he went through the glass. He could have killed someone, and he did that intentionally. So to me, like I think all the other shenanigans, even throwing the water bottle, that's one thing. But I honestly feel like this, he cried. It, it was like John Jones being stoned, going through the light. That's terrible. But seeing that he just hurt a woman and she's bleeding and running away from her to me that yep. crosses the line of it did of, cross uh, the line i think that crossed yep. the line and and i always think well just like the steroids when i argue with people about steroids well they shouldn't you know they should never fight again they shouldn't take their livelihood away i said if what if they were a cop if they get busted for drugs and they're a cop they're not gonna be a cop anymore the cops sure. the cop society isn't gonna say well i don't want to take their you know their their chance of making a living and, or doing what they love away. No, they once they cross that line of almost killing someone by throwing that hand truck right through the window. I don't know. To me, that was a line that was like unbelievable. I just that made me go from loving him to thinking he does not. I mean, I used to love the guy. You know, all this yeah. talk and everything. I thought he was like Muhammad Ali, just. But now I don't. So uh, we'll see. That, we'll see. That all being said, if he wants to fight again, we're going to see him fight again. Yeah. No matter what, <laughs> nobody's going to listen to us. But yeah. <laughs> Maybe someday. Someday they will. Yeah. So I don't know. That's how I feel about that. But there's there's a lot of shit. What do you think about that card? Uh, you know they they lost a lot of fights on that card, and uh, they it still was it was a decent card, and you know the fights that you know were out there, but. You know, when you took away the Chiesa versus uh, Pettis fight, that would have been a great fight, I thought. Yeah. Borg fight would have been great. You know, even Artem Lobov, you know, against Caceres, that's a good stylistic matchup. It would have been fun because Caceres is kind of, you know, out there crazy doing a lot of spinning stuff and Lobov is tough. And so they lost a lot in it. And, you know, it's one of those, that's where I look at, you know, with Connor, it's, he took away certain people's ability to make their living. And that's where it was. That's where I saw the real problem. Yeah. He didn't care. And, and when he did it, you know, John, you know that when guys are cutting weight, it yeah. sucks. Yeah. And you're not feeling good and you don't want to be at that media day thing, but you yeah. do it. And then that's when you're going to come after somebody and stuff. It's like, come on, dude, please. Imagine if Seattle's head was on the window and he was like just feeling down and that fucking thing just hit his head. Like right on, things would have been a lot. Things would have turned a whole different corner. I mean, to me, that's I always look at that. Like that's what he was doing, not even caring that this guy could have been resting his head on the window. He'd probably be in a coma right now. It's like, so yeah. That's why, that's why you got to you look at, you know, you, you try to tell younger guys, hey, you got to think about what you do and you got to make smart choices because one stupid thing can change your life forever. You didn't mean for it to happen, but it can change your life forever, and you don't want that to happen based off of uh, just a head up butts, you know, decision. So think about what you do, and you know that's exactly the situation. Connor needs to start thinking about what he's doing because, you know, from what I heard out of Dana's mouth, he still felt like he was right, and that right there, that starts to alter, you know, the whole thing on, you know, what do you do with him if you're the UFC when he's thinking that you know his actions were right. He needs to understand. No, he's not, not showing any remorse. remorse. No remorse at all. Exactly. What do you think? What do you think about when you look back? How old are you? Fifty-five. Oh, you're still younger than me. Um, <laughs> all right, if you look back at your life, what do you think about the cho the choices you made? Ah, uh, you know, I, I look at things all the time, and I made you know, I made some really good choices in my life. I made some horrible choices. What's the What's the best choice you made? I know there's more than one, but just give me one of the best choices you made. Oh, my God. You know, I hear as for for MMA, let's say, you know, when I was 30 years old, I met uh, this guy named Horion Gracie and I made the decision to go down to his uh, his house and roll with his brothers because he had invited me and stuff. And 
that was one of the best decisions I ever made. Now, did I know that one decision changes your whole life? Changed my entire life. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's something you try to get across to your kids is like you meet one person or two people in your life that have this huge effect on this trajectory you're on, you know, can totally change things for you. So that was that's a really cool moment for you uh, to make. Who knows who you would have been if you, you probably, didn't if you didn't go to that one yeah. that one thing. Yeah, yeah. you you did probably didn't make too many bad ones, but what was your worst choice you made <laughs> that you look back on you wish you never did? Oh god You know what? I got two. Two okay, let's you know I I you know my dad was always a you know a uh, big influence in my life and he was a very he was a hard ass. And when I was older, I was like twenty 22, 23 years old, he's at my house. And, you know, he always used to screw with me when I was a kid and hold me down and poke me. And he said something and I grabbed a hold of him and I put him down and I started doing that to him. And he's, you know, he was fighting back. He's, you know, trying to get me. I'm going, come on. And, I, and I'm doing stuff. And I realized just instantaneously he's working hard. And I went, I'm screwing up. And I jumped up and I picked him up. I said, I'm kidding with you. I'm sorry. And I picked him up. He goes, oh, no, right. And God damn if I could take that back. I would take it back because I, I looked at that and it was that moment that never needed to happen. And how old were you? I was about 22, 23 years old. You know, and again, thought I, you know, I wasn't afraid of anything. I thought I could beat the world at the time. And, you know, and it was not, not that I was trying to hurt him, but I was trying to prove to him I could play with him like he used to play with me. And just the dumbest thing ever. I, I hate myself for that to this day. You know, it's, it's where's your dad? What's that? Where's your dad? My dad lives in Dana Point. He's 81 years old. He's still ornery as hell, and I love him. Uh, He's my hero. So, what's the second thing? The second thing is, you know, I made decisions based, you know, with the UFC that I, I went and I did stuff. I, I was there for them instead of there for my family at times. And that was a mistake. Not saying that, you know, the UFC was a mistake, but. You know, I miss things like my son's high school graduation and stuff. And you know what? A fight's not that important. I, sh- I should have been there for my son's high school graduation instead of being with the UFC somewhere. And so, you know, that was a bad choice on my part. And I, I think about it all the time. So that's that's the kind of thing that still gnaws at me. Wow. That's, that's... You have any uplifting questions, John? <laughs> yeah, really. Come on, man. Come on. Okay. What? <laughs> I was gonna ask another bad one, thanks, but no. But as, on Debbie the Debbie Downer here, like on the second one, I mean, the, I'm sure your kid is like your son is like, yeah, my dad's Big John McCarthy. I mean, can you imagine being able to just walk around? I mean, because my kid, I don't, even, I'm not even Big John McCarthy. I'm just the pit master, and my kids, their whole life, yeah, my dad's this, my dad's that. I can't imagine your kids are like. My dad's Big John McCarthy. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? First off, my oldest son. He's in MMA. He's a judge and stuff, and you know, he does a great job. And he, you know, he doesn't really say anything that much, you know. But if someone says something, you know, he'll talk to him about. Yeah, that's my dad. My daughter's in the military. She tells nobody. She does not tell anybody. In fact, I'll come up to visit her, and they all go, "This is your dad, right?" And then she goes, "Yeah." And they go, "Why didn't you tell us, right?" And she goes, "He's mine. He's not yours." You know, and, and she just keeps it to herself. She doesn't tell anyone. My youngest son will use it to any advantage he can. He will he will get he will get dinner reservations under my name, you know, because his name's the same. And he'll say, yeah, it's for you know and it's like, are you kidding me? Don't do that, right? And he goes, why? It works. <laughs> How old is he? He's 24 years old now. I love that. Does he live in Vegas? No, he lives out in California still. He's uh somewhere down there in uh, the Inland Empire. Oh my god, that's fucking hilarious! I, that's a great one. Okay, what was your best fight ever? Don't have one. It's impossible. Okay. Yeah, I get I get asked that all the time, John, and it's there's no way in the world out of the thousands of fights I've done because you know if you want to say what's the best UFC fight, I can't even do that. Because how how do I sit there and say, you know, I had a trilogy between Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell. How great were all of those? The buildups and the fights themselves. The first fight was, you know, everyone was saying Chuck was going to be, and Randy wins it. And then the second one, everyone was saying Randy 
can't be beat by Chuck and Chuck knocks him out. It's a great fight. John Jones fights. Conor Gregor fights. You know, Nate Diaz the second time. Great fight. You know, uh, Rory Mc, you know, McDonald fights Robbie Lawler. All of them. How do you pick one over the other? It's impossible. And, it, you know, and I don't even try to do it. <laughs> right there, bro. That right, right there. That right there was like that's 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 so memorable. It's not even fun. It's it was crazy. It was crazy. Just that that one. Like I had it as a meme, you know, and it was like it just it was so perfect. So what's you, next? You, next, I have a uh, St. Louis, Missouri, this week with uh, Michael Chandler against Brandon Gertz in the uh, main event, and like I said, AJ McKees against uh, Justin Lawrence, and so it, they've got a lot of good fights on the card. It's going to be a fun one. Do you guys bring your beautiful wife to all your stuff? I don't get to bring her, but I do bring her. There's a difference. Get to bring means they pay for it. Do bring means I pay for it. But, you know, that's part of, you know, my whole growing up thing is uh, I understand what's important and spending time with her and having her be part of what I do. If yeah. she wants to be there, I want her to be there. And so she gets to ch pick and choose where she goes. And if she wants to go, I buy the ticket and she goes with me. That's yeah, cool. that is really cool. I love seeing her uh, social media stuff when she's she's all over with her with her man. It's uh, it's really cool. Uh, she's awesome. Yeah, yeah. People, what's funny is in the MMA world, you know, she used to work for the UFC. She was the event coordinator there for a long time. You know, when Chuck first started, Elaine was the one that was, you know, calling Chuck and getting him his, you know, plane ticket and doing all the stuff. And, you know, and then that ended after a while. But she, uh, you know, she loves the fights. She loves the fighters. And finally, she started doing my, she managed me because I, I was, I'm horrible at, you know, uh, being a businessman, I suck, you know, because I'll give everything away for free. So she, you know, my wife is known as she's the meanest person in MMA to most uh, promoters and stuff because she's she drives a hard bargain. She doesn't put up with anything, and uh, she she made life easy on me throughout my career because I didn't I never knew how much I was making anywhere. I didn't care. She would say, "This is where you're going next," and just send me on my way. And sometimes she came with me, so like she's been wife. great. Yeah, keep you in mind. <laughs> what do you, what do you, um, what, what, what do you feel about the difference between living in Vegas versus L.A.? Uh, you know, the the big difference is just the time, time and ease and getting around. The, the reason I left, you know, I, I grew up in L.A. I lived there for 50, 50 some years, and it just got to a point. I was, I was, I was driving to the airport one day, and I was stuck in traffic again because there's nothing but traffic in LA all day long. And I just said, that's it. I'm done. I'm not sitting in this anymore. <laughs> and I went to Vegas because McCarran airport is like 15 minutes away. And it was just to try to make my life easier. Do you live in Henderson? I live in what's called mountain's edge, which is on the other side of the 15 from Henderson. Okay. Near Summerlin. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause you know, we got a pit there. Yeah. Yeah. We're at, um, it's, uh, it was in like Henderson all the way down, but now, uh, now it's like right by sunset, uh, by, uh, you know, the, uh, the, their hotel, the, uh, um, where is it? It's right by sunset, right by, uh, right. What, what hotel is that? I forget. I know the, the, the brothers own it. It's one of their, one of their hotels. And it's yeah, right by Aloha kitchen. Oh, is it, you talking about Boulder station? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's at the far end of Henderson. Yeah, and it's okay. uh, it's well, it's in more right across from a shopping center, and it's by the yeah, it's by one of the Fertitas brothers, and then uh, and there's a Aloha Kitchen right there, and that's where it is now. So okay. it's Henderson ish, but you like it there in Vegas? I do. I really like it here. It's you know, I love the hot weather. It makes all my joints don't hurt. Yeah, so that's the best part about that, and uh, I take I'll take the heat any time over cold. And you think you get more bang from your buck for the for oh, no doubt? Yeah, you know, I, I have my pen. I was an LAPD police officer, and you know I got a pension there, and I got ten percent. I got a ten percent raise when I moved because the state of California lost by taking the tax out. So, oh yeah, not oh, bad. Yeah. Huh? That's we have cool. to make it up now. 
<laughs> <laughs> They're always in our pockets. Boy, aren't they. Yeah. So well, we, we look forward to your next part of your career, watching you do what you do now. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're actually, we were, to be honest, we were just talking about that because we were like, we were no, I, I never watched a real Bellator. I think I like seen a bits and pieces and I was like, we don't going to watch Bellator. But then it's like, Big John's working for Bellator now. You're going to so bring a lot of people. You're going to bring a lot of people to, to Bellator. I hope I they hope, know that. You know, the, my, my whole thing is this. I, I don't I don't try to sit there and say, oh, we're better than the UFC or you know anything like that. But great MMA fights are done all over the world yeah. by a lot of different promotions. And I've done a lot of great fights that no one's ever seen, you know, in different places. And Bellator has some phenomenal fighters. Yeah. You know, yeah. I will tell you right now, like I said, they're, they're 170 pound division. You know, Roy McDonald is the yeah, champion there. The brother, uh, Lamas, Lemus, Lamas. Oh, Douglas Lima. Yeah. Douglas Lima. Holy shit. Yeah, he's phenomenal. Yeah. He is one hell of a fighter. Yeah. Look at the 170s in Bellator, the 145s, the 155s. They're all, they got some studs in there that can fight with anybody. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, the, the sport's not about negotiate what, you know, and it was Lorenzo that, that did it. He created, you know, this thing about the UFC was like Kleenex. You know, you want a tissue? No, I want a Kleenex. And yeah. that's the way people look at MMA and the UFC is it's one. Right. But there's great MMA being done all over the place, and Bellator puts on some great MMA fights. And you know, it, it's not about one promotion; it's about the sport. Right. They just they just got to get out more because it's it's the Kleenex because of their promoting, and just like you know, everybody thinks the Kleenex is a tissue. Everybody thinks MMA. I so many people come up to me and goes, "Hey, you guys do that UFC type fighting?" You know. Yep. So that's yep. yeah. It is it is about that. But anyway. All right, brother. Well, we gotta go, and uh, man, I really appreciate you being on. Man. We're gonna we're gonna have to call uh, you again. For having me, bro. And uh, next Anything time we're in Vegas, do. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give you a shout. Please do. All right, and uh, thanks for everything. Love to hear what else from. we got? Anything else you want to ask him? No, that's good. I just appreciate it too. I want to say thank you. So thanks, Sean. It's my pleasure, man. You guys take care. All Dang. right. Thanks, brother. I'll talk take to you. Take it easy. Bye bye. Oh, that was perfect, man. That was.